morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. I'm Jeremy Schulten. I'm the senior pastor here, and we want to welcome you to our virtual worship experience. We invite you to participate in this service as much as you feel led. So please join us as we head inside and begin our worship service. Thank you. 
This has been called one of the best known sentences in the English language containing the most potent and consequential words in American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The passage came to represent a moral standard to which the United States should strive. This view was notably promoted by Lincoln, who considered the Declaration of Independence to be the foundation of his political philosophy and argued that it is a statement of principles through which the United States Constitution should be interpreted. It was July 4th, 1776, 244 years ago. The declaration which was addressed to King George would not arrive in the monarch's hands until the next month. Three Georgians would sign it. Among them was Dr. Lyman Hall, the namesake of our own Hall County, although he likely had never set foot in the county named for him. Hall was born in 1724 in Wallingford, Connecticut, and became a minister like his father. He also trained at the Yale College of Medicine. While the day of the original signing was largely uneventful, Independence Day has become a day that we honor our freedom and those who have fought to, over the years to preserve it. We have current members of this congregation who wore the uniform of the United States of America in World War II, the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, and the battles against terrorism in the Middle East. We honor them today. We honor those who served in public office during those times, made decisions in Congress to engage in war. We also honor those who helped nurse the wounded back to health as they returned home with the scars of battle. While Independence Day has become a day of celebration and picnics and fireworks and joy, let us never forget and may God bless those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that was proclaimed on July 4th, 1776. Oh, my God. 
can I lead us in prayer to start our service? Almighty God, we come before you this morning to worship you. And as we do that, we remind ourselves that when we invite you to meet with us in worship, that everything has become holy around us. So wherever we are beginning this worship service, whether it's here in this building or in our own homes listening or on the radio driving in the car, Father, we just ask you to make this a time that is holy in our hearts as we focus upon you, your love for us, the great gift of your son, Jesus Christ, through whom we know you and trust you and have confidence in your promise of eternal life. And so, Father, we ask that you would bless us, but that even more than that, that you would be blessed by the words we speak and the songs we sing as we worship you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you to this worship service. This will be heard on Sunday morning, uh, July 5th. We hope that you had a great uh, July 4th, although it was probably a very different one than usual. We hope you were safe, but that you enjoyed it and, and gave thanks to God for the country we live in, the beautiful United States of America that we love and that we serve and that we cherish. I want to um, say a few things to you about the changes that are happening in our church this week. Uh, first, let me just tell you about some events that are happening. I would like to call our youth and youth parents uh, attention to the fact that there are two youth activities this week and college age as well happening on Tuesday and Wednesday. Be sure and check your emails and your constant contact for that information. I have a dinner on Tuesday at 6.30 and I have a youth movie uh, here outside at 8.15 on Wednesday evening. The last movie they had was a big hit. A lot of folks come. Bring your own seating if you're going to be outside and join us. Bring a blanket for the lawn. Please join in with that. And then Saturday, a family missions uh, midday event. Chalk the church. Basically, we're going to have chalk for everyone who comes, young and old, and there's going to be uh, the opportunity for us to mark off safe distances for some of our outside services that are starting soon. But the main thing I want to tell you about is next Sunday, on the 12th of July, we are planning to reopen our Sunday morning worship services in this way. Uh, please look into the publications on the church website. You will be getting emails again uh, that will announce the times and details. But let me go through those with you and invite you to prayerfully consider whether you can rejoin us with face-to-face -face worship at First Baptist next Sunday. We'll begin with an 8 o'clock in the morning, front steps of the sanctuary, almost sunrise service. Bring your own seating. Masks and other precautions will be recommended but not required since we'll be outside. And that will be a, probably a 40 to 45 minute worship service. And we'll ask you to consider coming to that. My wife and I are planning that already. Hope you can come. And then at 11, Next Sunday, we'll have worship here in this room in our church sanctuary, and we will have a limit this first Sunday of 200 people total in attendance. The way you can join us next Sunday is by making a reservation either through Push Pay, that's the app on the phone that you make reservations for the first at first meals, and some of you are familiar with that. If you're not familiar with that, feel free to call our church office, our church number, beginning at 8.30 Sunday morning. And we will take reservations all week long. And then when we reach the 200, we'll invite you, if you choose to be with us face-to-face, -to, -face, to go into our banquet hall for the live stream from this sanctuary service. That will be our pattern for several weeks. And then we will add a third service at 9.30 in the banquet hall that will uh, be live with our pastor, our minister of music and musicians, and all the folks doing worship at 9.30 in the banquet hall, and then coming in here at 11. But the important thing is that does not start until mid-August, if we can start it then. Next week, it's sanctuary only, and 8 o'clock out on the front steps. So let us know your plans for next week. 
Let me just stress that the inside worship in our sanctuary, sanctuary will be masks required. And that means masks over nose and mouth, not hanging loose or hanging halfway. We need to do that so that a lot of people who would like to worship with us will feel safe coming. So we know that it's not something that we're all comfortable with or happy with, but if you're planning to come, please bring your mask and plan to wear it for that 45 minutes as you worship here in the sanctuary, or we'll have masks for you as you come in. Now let's continue with our worship, and thank you for being with us this morning. Oh, Lord, our suffering. 
The Lord said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. for this time of prayer, I invite you to join with me. Let us pray together. O Lord God, with one word, you brought the world and all of the universe together. At a word, light was separated from darkness. At your word, creation was birthed into being. At your word, uh, uh, livelihood uh, enters into this very world. Your word, Lord, has brought good things to us, and we are here because of your divine calling, summoning word. And for that we give thanksgiving, we give praise. But Lord, you know too that with our words so often we have broken apart your creation's intention. Our words have brought fragmentation onto this globe we know of war and poverty. We know of distress, curses where there should be blessings. And Lord, even those things that do not come by our word, words like pandemic and other things that have fractured this world, this too, Lord, is sorrowful to all and especially to you, you who desire so much. So Lord, we lean into your word today. We lean into your life-giving word that you may breathe anew and afresh, that you may drive out all that fragments and tears apart, that you may drive out the sin that so easily encumbers our walk, that you may drive out the darkness that so often shadows our eyes, that you drive out the fear that often cloaks our heart. It is your word, Lord, that we have come to listen your word that sustains and gives, your word that brings us to life, even life everlasting. And so, Lord, we continue to lean in your word through the prayer you first taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Fourth of July weekend, we offer thanks. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we acknowledge with thanks all that we enjoy as a gift from your gracious hand. We come before you today in heartfelt appreciation for our nation and its people. You have enriched us with the bounties of farm and factory, the beauty of forests and mountains and the marvels of medicine and science. We have so many blessings and freedoms to be grateful for, but there is no greater feeling of liberty than to experience the freedom that we have through Jesus Christ. As Christ followers, help us to be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations. This morning we offer our gifts, our tithes and offerings as a response to your graciousness. Gather our congregation and opportunities to respond to people's needs. Fill us with your spirit so that we're eager to help others. Use these gifts that we offer to quiet the traffic and turmoil of life's stresses and help our tithes be able to share the gentle and humble message of Jesus Christ. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.
make a name Strolling in the sun yet nothing gained We all return to dust from whence we came begin by thanking you for this opportunity to be in this great congregation and in particular thanking Jeremy Schulte. I had given him a, a cursory welcome when he began here as pastor of this church just simply telling him what a great congregation he has come to and it wasn't but a few weeks later that he invites me to come and preach to you good people. I thought that was quite remarkable Jeremy doesn't know me. Jeremy never's heard me. And yet he's trusted this uh, historic and wonderful pulpit over to me at this time. So thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, church, for hosting me uh, at this important time in the history of your church. I also want to say, as uh, in my role at McAfee School of Theology of Mercer University, to thank you for your historic and ongoing support to our School of Theology. You have been with us from the very beginning. Uh, you've been a part of not only financially supporting this church, but recommending students to come study with us, to employing them to serve in your congregation in a variety of ways. You have prayed for us. You have watched over us. You are part of this great tradition that our School of Theology continues with more than 850 alumni serving all over the, all over the world. Indeed, we've even had students serving on each and every continent here on this great globe. So thank you for your continued service to our school. We are grateful and we're better because of it. I want to share with you two texts of scripture for us this morning, an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading as part of this sermon message. Hear with me these words of the Lord as we find them in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 beginning with verse 9. What gain of all the workers from their toil? I have seen the busyness of God that has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better than, them, than, to, enjoy, than to enjoy a happy life themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is... God's gift that all should eat 
and drink and take pleasure in all of their toil. This is from the book of Ecclesiastes. For our New Testament reading, I invite you to follow along in the gospel according to Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 61. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to them, no one who has put his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. These are God's words for God's people. Thanks be to God. So not too many years ago, I was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Augusta, Georgia, served that great congregation for 10 years. Um, Will Dyer, yes, your own Will Dyer, has followed me and is now busily cleaning up the mess that I took a decade in creating. Now, while I was serving there as pastor, uh, each year I would take a group of juniors and seniors, 10, 15, some years as many as 20, we would go on a backpacking trip. And many years we would drive right by this church on the way to Springer Mountain, uh, just outside of Dahlonega, Georgia. And there, these young people, many of them for the very first time would get the experience of climbing a mountain, let alone backpacking for a couple of days. And I tell you, it's, it's, it's really a treat to be with people who have, after working hard all day, making their way slowly, but uh, most certainly up to a mountain, catching the vista, looking it over, even taking a few pictures, feeling as though they've really accomplished something. Now, unlike Will, I'm not a golfer. So climbing mountains, that is hiking these backcountry trails, is my thing. But even if you don't like hiking uh, in the mountains, you can appreciate what it must feel like to, to reach a summit, to catch a vista, notice a view, and feel as though something has been accomplished. Well, I want to share with you that these stories are mountain climbing kind of stories, figuratively speaking. Reminds me of a wonderful book I read a couple of years ago by the New York Times columnist David Brooks called The Second Mountain. I commend it to you. David, uh, David Brooks was at the time of writing going through a significant life change. Uh, he had finished a very painful divorce. And although he was, is at the height of his career, he realized that there's something missing. And so he began exploring what that missing element was in his life. And it resulted in a powerful book called The Second Mountain. The thesis goes like this. There is a mountain you climb in life, the first mountain. It's the ego. It's the, it's the building the container. It's wrestling with the assumption that I am what the world says I am. And all of us, he writes, climb that kind of mountain, the mountain of building an ego, answering the world's question, I am what the world says I am. The first mountain, he says, you conquer. But the second mountain, it conquers you. It is the mountain that summons you to a life of something deeper, something thicker, as I said this morning, we have two kind of mountain texts here of Scripture. I don't mean that Ecclesiastes or the Gospel of Luke take place on a mountaintop per se. They're not literal, but they're the kind of mountaintop experiences that both stories have us looking over a vista of sorts, a platform looking ahead to something bigger. Now let's take Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament reading for this morning. Ecclesiastes begins with an author who goes by the Hebrew name Koheleth. Now Koheleth in your English translations may be translated as the preacher or the teacher. The name literally means to assemble or to gather. Uh, I'd like to add it means to summon Koheleth. Koheleth of Ecclesiastes has some things to say to us. I think of Koheleth as an old person that's wise, someone who has lived life and has experiences, someone who has climbed and conquered mountains, but also someone who knows what it feels like to be conquered by a mountain. Koheleth has lived life and has some things to say. It's not about hedonism, as the text may imply, 
eat, drink, and be merry. It's more like what it means to live this one solitary life as the true gift of God that it is. It reminds me of a poem by Mary Oliver who died just a couple of years ago. Mary Oliver was reflecting on a grasshopper eating out of the palm of her hand a cube of sugar. And from that, she spins out these wonderful words. She writes, I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down into the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? And here are the lines that really get me, and I've shared them at many a funeral. She writes, tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? It's as if Mary Oliver is channeling these words of Koheleth of Ecclesiastes, the person who has not only climbed the first mountain, but climbing the mountain that really matters. And then you have this story from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, the story of Jesus where he says, no one who puts their hand to the plow and turns back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, is it me or is it just a, a whiff of toxic masculinity that kind of comes out in me when I listen to those lines? Because I remember when I was a younger man preaching from this text of Scripture and I thought, yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Jesus. When you put your hand to the plow, you're to go forward and not turn back. But oh, I was younger then. So was Jesus in his early 30s. Unlike Kohela, Jesus is a young man. And just a few verses earlier, Jesus tells us, or rather Luke, the gospel writer, tells us that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Think about these two stories, Kohela, the old man, and Jesus, the young one, both having mountaintop kind of experiences. And even though they are telling in many ways different stories, they're saying the same thing. The old man looking back and the young man looking forward, they're saying to us what it means to live a life that matters. And that's what brings us here, right? Sunday after Sunday, living a life that matters. That's what brings you to watching this service online. Though it is not ideal and not preferred, you're doing it right. Because deep down, we all, young and old alike, want the same thing. To know that this one solitary life we've been given will actually matter. Because in the end, it's not about a job. It's about a calling. It's not about a career. It's about a vocation. It's not about making a living. It's about making a life. What happens when you lose your job? And we'll all lose our job one day, even if your job is, is a familial one, a, a volunteer one, a, a one that obligates you with your family, or whether it is a long-standing career path, one day we will all lose our job. It may come by retirement. It may come by way of termination. It may come by elimination. But when you lose your job, do you lose your calling? When you lose your job, do you, do you lose your identity? Do you when you lose your job, do you lose your sense of, of well-being? I say to you, no. A, a calling is an answering to a summons of life. Now, I work in, uh, in, in the world of theological education these days, and, and our primary concern with our students is about vocation, not getting a job or, or living out a duty, those things are important. But whenever we gather our students at the beginning of each year during orientation, I say to them, now if you've come here so that you can leave here and get a good job, you've made a mistake. Now some of them don't like to hear that. I quickly add, and don't get me wrong, I want you to be employed when you graduate from here. 
but you are here to work on your vocation. You are here because on some level you've answered God's summons in your life to live a life that matters. After all, that word vocation comes from the Latin vocatus, which simply means a calling, to be called, to be summoned. Howard Thurman was a New Testament scholar who taught at Spelman decades ago, but he's not really known as being a great New Testament scholar, although his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, is one of the best one can read. I commend that one to you. But he's rather known simply as a Christian mystic. And he has these words that I love to use with our theology students when they go through ordination. I'll write them a letter and I'll include this quote in the letter to them, commending them for their ordination. Howard Thurman remarks, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Now I want to stop there and ask you to reflect on that. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Think about what we often tell young people when they're getting ready to either go away to college and study a, a particular major, or maybe they're preparing for uh, some type of trade as they finish high school studies. But whatever it is, we often counsel our young people to choose a field that is lucrative. I'm a father of two adult sons. I understand. I want my children to stay gainfully employed. Please stay gainfully employed. But I raise my children also to, to know it's not about simply working a job for the money. It's about answering a call, all of us. Again, Thurman says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself, he says, what makes you come alive? And go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. That's it, isn't it? What is it that makes you come alive, that stirs your soul, that, that leads you to the handle of the, of the plow, ready to move forward? And Jesus reminds us that when you, have, when you find it or found by it, don't look back. Move on. I taught a class last fall uh, called Models of Moral Leadership. It was a class of both uh, narrative ethics as well as leadership. And so for that class, we, we taught about individuals like Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman and Florence Nightingale, uh, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr. And, and throughout that class, we'd spend time not only learning about the history of these individuals, but we would spend some time talking about what was the calling in their lives. Many of them had a life interrupted. Harriet Tubman was illiterate, but her calling was to uh, liberate those that were enslaved. Abraham Lincoln wanted to be a, a country lawyer and was doing a good job at it. And instead he found himself presiding over the United States in the midst of a civil war. Nelson Mandela too sought out to be a lawyer and spent 27 years in prison before becoming the face of freedom in South Africa. All of these came on some level out of a calling. What is it that stirs your soul and makes you come alive? Go do that because that's what the world needs. Why is this so important in a class on moral leadership? Because without a sense of living a life that matters, Morality is just simply reduced to a list of do's and don'ts and shoulds and oughts. Without a sense of vocation, a sense of calling, a sense of being summoned, leadership just simply risks moral bankruptcy. The question every seminarian, and for that matter, all the rest of us, confronts us in our life's work is to answer that notion of calling. Victor Frankl uh, spent years in a concentration camp. Prior to that, he was a psychoanalyst. And after uh, his own liberation from the concentration camp, he went on to uh, carry a very productive career as a psychoanalyst. But during his time in the concentration camp, it was there that, that he observed that some people had a will to live and 
Other people tragically died even before their time amidst harsh realities. He said that we're all dealing with the same question, are we not? What is life asking of me? And when you can answer that question, what is life asking of me? It can lead you through even the deathly gallows of a concentration camp. You can be an exceptional banker. But if you're not living a life that matters, what does it matter? You can be an acclaimed physician, but if you're not living a life that matters, what does it matter? You can be a powerful litigator, a, an influential teacher, a remarkable preacher, an exemplary nurse, a fastidious CPA, but if you're not living a life that matters, what does it matter? My brothers and sisters, both Koheleth of Ecclesiastes and and Jesus of the Gospel of Luke, they are two very different lives to be sure. And they are indeed speaking from different kind of mountaintop experiences. But both of them, one looking back and the other one looking ahead, are calling on us to, for the same thing. Do you see the view? The life that matters for you. I love how Toni Morrison writes about vocation and job. She writes it, whatever the work is, do it well. You make the job, the job doesn't make you. And maybe more importantly, she goes on to say, you are not the work you do. You are the person you are. You are fit for the kingdom of God. First Baptist Gainesville, you are fit. And while we are about plowing our respective fields, let us remember the words of Koheleth of Ecclesiastes. It is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. There's a life summoning you. May you and I be faithful to attain it. Thanks be to God. Amen. And amen. We'd like to thank you for joining us for worship at First Baptist Church Gainesville. We'd like to extend a special thank you to our musicians and to Dr. Greg Deloach for bringing our message today. At this time, we want you to know that if you feel led of God's spirit to become a Christian and to be baptized, we encourage you to call the church to let us know of your decision. And one of our ministers would be happy to speak with you. If you would like to unite with our church, please do the same. Call us at the church office or email us so that we can hear your story. And also, if you feel led to enter into Christian service or ministry, we'd love to hear about that as well. Once again, we are so glad that you joined us for worship today. If you would receive this benediction, 
will then be dismissed. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Thank you.